Good morning. Uh, my name is Patrick Allen, and uh, today is May the 26th, 2023. I am an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. And uh, locally, that program is conducted through the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library under the direction of Ryan Powers. And today we have the pleasure of interviewing a Vietnam veteran, Robert Van Waldy. Uh, and do you go by Robert or Bob? Bob is fine. Bob, thank you for doing this interview. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for taking your time and thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, before we get started on your military career, uh, let's talk about your, your background. Uh, what are your mother and father's names? Okay, my, my dad's name was uh, Robert Von Waldy, and my mother's name was Naomi uh, Von Waldy. Her maiden name was Pew. Uh, she came from Tennessee. My dad was born here in Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, they met when he was in the service stationed down in Tennessee is where they met. What branch of service was he in? He was in the Army Air Corps. And about when was that? Uh, that would have been back in the Second World War. You, you have any idea what years? Uh, probably uh, 43, 44 maybe, I think. Not... What was your dad's occupation? Uh, after he got out of the military, he worked for a printing company here in Lockland, Ohio, uh, called uh, Diamond International, and he was a machine operator, ran a big uh, printing printing press. Did your mother work outside the home? Uh, she did. She worked for, for Procter and Gamble. She was a technician at one of their, or a couple of different plants down in St. Bernard, and then one up on Center Hill here in Cincinnati, also. Where did your dad go to school? He went to he went to St. Clement Grade School in St. Bernard, Ohio. Then he went to Roger Bacon High School in uh, St. Bernard, Ohio. Graduated from there, obviously. Graduated from there, yes, sir. How about mom? Where did she go to school? Uh, she went to high school down in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Dyersburg? Dyersburg, okay. yeah. Um, D-Y-E-R-S-B-U-R-G, Dyersburg, yeah. Did... Uh, she work after graduation from high school before she got married? I think she had some jobs at a couple different stores or restaurants or something like that, but I don't think she really had a, you know, a full-time job. They got married and uh, moved up here to Cincinnati. Well, she, she was living in Tennessee. How'd your dad uh, meet her? He met her when he was in the, he was stationed in the military down there, and uh, that's where they met when he was stationed down there in Tennessee. They met and... Uh, where and when were you born? I was born November 29th, 1948, here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Where were you born? Uh, a place called uh, St. Joseph's uh, Maternity Hospital. Uh, did you have brothers and sisters? I have uh, five siblings, yes. I have three sisters and two brothers. Where did you fit in the five? I, I was second. Six? I had an older sister than, than me, and then uh, the other four came came next. Well, let's let's run through them briefly. Uh, okay. Who was who was your older sister? My older sister was Sue, and she's two years older than I am. She's seventy six years old. Still living. Still living. Good. Yep. And then you were born. And, then and I was then who's born. Who's the next one? And after that would have been my brother John. He's sixty five years old. And then my brother Steve, uh, or my brother John was 70 years old, I'm sorry. And my brother Steve would be next, he was 65 years old. Then I had a sister Donna, who was 63 years old, and a sister Rita, who was 60 years old. And they're all still alive and uh, live in Cincinnati. Oh, they're all in Cincinnati they're area? All, all in Cincinnati oh, area, yes. That's great, do you have a chance to get together with them frequently? We get together pretty frequently, yes. Super. Yep. Uh, what what does Sue do? Is she employed? Uh, she's not employed. Uh, earlier in her career, she worked at a, a savings and loan. Uh, but for the last many years, she hadn't worked outside the home. Sue married. Sue's married. What's to, her What's uh, her married name? Uh, Bible. She's married to Greg Bible. B i b l e. B i b l e. Yes, sir. Right. 
And is her husband still living? He's still living also, yep. Right. How about your brother John? My brother John, he's married to Linda. And uh, they live in uh, Anderson Township. And did you, what kind of work did John do? Uh, he worked at, the, at Christ Hospital for several years. Then he left that job and he went to work for the Park District in Anderson Township where he did a lot of their maintenance and uh, took care of their soccer fields and baseball fields and stuff like that. So he worked for the township up there in Anderson. So he's retired now? He's he? retired now, yes. How about Steve? What kind of... Steve, he's an, he's an attorney. Uh, he worked many years for in the legal... Uh, for uh, Macy's department store. Uh, a few years ago, they cut back and he got let go there. So now he does uh, consulting work on his own. Uh, so he still practices? He still practices, yes. Uh -huh. well, I'm an attorney too and I still practice because I haven't gotten it right yet. Yeah. <laughs> How about Steve, is he married? He's married to Gail, yeah. Uh, how's, how's Gail spell her name? G-A-I-L or G-A-Y-L-E? G-A-I-L. And how about Donna? Donna, uh, she worked for an insurance company, a big insurance company downtown for several years. But here for the last 20 or so years, she's worked at the uh, St. Bernard High School uh, Board of Education in their office down there. Is Donna married? Donna's married to uh, Tim, Tim Spradlin. So her name is Spradlin now. Uh, spell Spradlin for us. S-P-R-A-D-L-I-N. All right. And Rita? Your youngest? Rita, uh, she works like customer service on phones. Uh, I think she mostly works out of her home. Uh, she's married. Who, who does she work for? Uh, well, you know, I don't know off the top of my head okay. who she actually works for. What, what's her husband's name? Her husband's name is, uh, <laughs> oh gosh, why do I do this? Russell, Russell Hydorn. Hi Dorn. Hi Dorn. H E I D O R N. Right. What What's Russ do? Or is he retired? Uh, he works for a machine company out in Woodlawn, Ohio. What does he do there? Do you know? Uh, he just runs some type of big equipment. I'm not exactly machine what sort. operator of some sort. Yeah, an operator of some sort. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, let's uh, talk about yourself. Uh, you, you were born uh, November 29th at St. Joe's, and then where did you live at that time with the family? I uh, lived at, uh, in St. Bernard, Ohio on 324 East Ross Avenue, which is only about a mile from where I was born. It was right down the street. <laughs> How long did you live there? Oh, I guess I lived there most of my life until I went into the military. So I lived there from the time I was born until uh, 1968 when I went into the military. Where'd you go to grade school? I went to grade school at St. Clement there in St. Bernard, Ohio. And how about high school? You went, High you... school, I went, to, I went to Roger Bacon one year and then I ended up going to St. Bernard High School. And that's where I graduated from was St. Bernard. So you're a family Catholic? Yes. Uh, do you belong to a parish now? Uh, no. Did you work while you were uh, going to high school? Did you work? At, uh, I did. School? I worked at uh, King's Pharmacy there in St. Bernard. I was a clerk. And I, I delivered newspapers. So at uh, King's Pharmacy, uh, when, when were you working there? What, what, how old were you or what grades were you in? Uh, I was probably a junior when I was a, probably a junior and senior in high school. I worked there, I assume. All right. And, how did that come about? Did you work just after school or weekends? Yeah, or? just worked after school and some weekends, uh, yeah, Saturdays. I believe it was closed on Sundays, but yeah, on Saturdays I worked. What did you, uh, what did you do there for the pharmacy? Uh, I waited on customers when they came in. I stocked shelves, just whatever he needed me to do, you know, straightened up the place if it needed it, just whatever. Well, with going to school, attending classes and working at the pharmacy, I'm, I'm assuming, and maybe wrongly so, that you didn't have time to get into sports? Yes, I did. I ran track and cross country at St. Bernard. Well, good. Uh, what, what did you run in track? Uh, tra Stand by. We need to stop tape a second. 
Uh, we, we were talking about uh, your, your sports. What did you run in track? Uh, track, I was mostly a sprinter, but uh, being from a small school and a small team, sometimes you had to run a little extra. So I ran the 100, the 220, the 440, uh, relays, broad jump. So several different, different uh, things, low hurdles. How did you do it in track? Uh, did you qualify for any regionals? I did pretty good. I did uh, my senior year. I qualified for regionals in the in the low hurdles. Good. The one eighty low hurdles. Good. Um, you know, I was from a small school, and we all had to run all kinds of events hey, ourselves. Exactly. Yep. Uh, and you were going to St. Bernard at that time. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, how did you work that in with the pharmacy and the homework and all? Well, I, the pharmacy was pretty, you know, they were pretty liberal. He knew I was going to school and knew I, you know, did the sports and stuff. So he was pretty flexible on when I could work or he'd work around that, you know. And uh, I don't know, uh, doing the homework, I guess it just wasn't that hard, really. And just made sure you made time to do it, so. Now you mentioned you uh, did the broad jump. Nowadays, uh, to be politically correct, they call oh, it the long the jump. The long jump, they? exactly, yep. So how did, uh, being a small school, how did you get to your track meets? Did parents take you or did you yeah, get the school bus? Usually parents or the coach, everybody get in a coach's car or something and drive, yeah. We didn't take any buses at that time. I think the only time we took a bus anywhere was our when we went to the state cross country meet our senior year also. And where was that? Uh, the state cross country meet was held in Columbus at Ohio State on the Ohio State campus. How did your team do in that? Uh, we came in, I believe, it was eighth in the state that year. That's nice. That's so, nice. Yeah. I was a top top finisher for our team. I came in, I think, twenty second. Great, great. Uh, did your mom or dad have a chance to go to any of your track meets? Uh, they did. They they didn't go to all of them because, like I say, they both worked, and you know, right after school, they were both working. But they did get a chance to go to some of them. Yeah. Good. And that probably was a big help to you. Yeah. Right? Yep. So you graduated from St. Bernard in uh, '68. Uh, I graduated in '67. '67. Yep. And when you graduated, uh, did you go to work or did you enlist? Uh. I started to go to college for a while. Where? Uh, I went to UC, uh, and it just wasn't my thing. So uh, that's when I, and while I was going, I got my draft notice anyway, and I just went down and joined. So I went to UC for a short time, but it just uh, wasn't my thing. College just wasn't my thing. <laughs> We're talking a matter of weeks or months at UC? Uh, probably months. I probably went there for a semester or so, but, and, uh, and then so I, so you I, got I dropped your draft out. notice, and when you got that, you went down. I, I just went down to the draft board and just went ahead and volunteered and said, you know, if we're going to go, let's go now. Uh, so, what branch of service did you volunteer for? Uh, the Army. Why did you pick the Army? Well, when you get drafted, that's the one they send you to. When you go down to the board, they take some people from the Army and put them in the Marines, and I just they just kept me with the Army, and that's where I ended up going. And I enjoyed the whole time. I really enjoyed it. What had your dad been in? My dad was in the Army Air Corps. What What did your mom and dad think about you uh, volunteering after you got your draft notice? Well, they were okay with that. They had no problem. They, I think they were probably proud of me. Where was it that you signed up? Uh, downtown Cincinnati here in Hamilton County. Went down to the draft board down there to sign up and left that same day. You left the same day left, from where? Left the same day. Uh, Went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training. What town is that near? Uh, is that near Charleston? No, that it's near uh, Columbia. Columbia, South Carolina would be the big city it was by. How long have you done at Fort Jackson? Uh, just down there for, what, two or three months, however long basic training was, eight, eight ten weeks, whatever, so just that short period of time. Well, tell the folks that might be watching this uh, what you had to do, what you had to go through for your basic. Uh, basics, a lot of physical and and mental stuff. The physical is just a lot of running, a lot of jumping, a lot of, you know, practicing rifles and bayonet training and stuff like that. 
the physical stuff was for me anyway because I was pretty physically fit from running track and cross country and stuff wasn't so bad but the mental stuff you know, all the yelling the drill sergeant yelling and you know doing stuff like that I think that was harder on people than than the physical stuff was was the mental you had to really be set up for that I believe going through that mental aspect of I mean, it did that help you when you got uh, into uh uh, in Vietnam? I, I believe it did, yeah. Right. yeah. Where'd you go from Fort Jackson? Uh, from Fort Jackson, I went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Uh, that was for advanced infantry training. And that was the same same amount of time, you know, two or three months for the training. How long were you there? Uh, just, just that two or three month period. Just long enough to take that training. And from there, it was straight from there to, to Vietnam. So did you have Time to go from uh, from Fort Leonard Wood to uh, home before you went to Vietnam. Did, did come home for a short short time before I went to Vietnam, uh, maybe a week or something, uh, not very long, but did come home before I had to ship out. Did you have a girlfriend during high school? Uh, Joyce, my wife, my present wife. We were together in high school. Were you uh, going to the same school? No, yeah. no, she was. Yeah, we went to the same, same school. school. Yeah, St. Bernard. Yep. Graduate same time? She graduated two years later. She graduated in 1969. Right. So uh, you got a younger woman going with you. Yeah, sure All do. Right. Got a younger one, yeah. <laughs> so uh, did you communicate with her when you were at Fort Jackson and Fort Leonard Wood? Yeah, yeah. Called whenever I could, which wasn't too often. When, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're going through training, but... Uh, Wrote letters. Yeah, we stayed in contact the whole time. Did you ever have? <coughs> did you ever have a time before you came home for that week or so uh, before you went to Vietnam? Did you have any time to uh, spend weekends or anything going home to see Joyce or your parents? No, no, not at all. Uh, so you go to Vietnam. Uh, where do you go uh, to uh, leave the states? Uh, we left. Uh, from the state of Washington. As How well. did you get to Washington? Uh, we flew from from down at uh, Fort Leonard Wood. A military plane or Mil commercial? Commercial plane. And then we went up to uh, Seattle, Washington. I forget the name of the fort that was up there where they process you and stuff. I don't even remember the name of it, to tell you the truth. And from there we took a commercial flight to Vietnam then. Uh, Where did, did you have any stopovers between uh, Washington and Vietnam? I think we stopped over in Hawaii and Guam and then I think Vietnam. <clears throat> Get off the plane at either Hawaii or Guam? Uh, we got off the plane <laughs> just long enough to stretch our legs or something, not any time to do anything. I think they let us off just to walk around the airport a little bit, the terminal while they were refueling and then uh, got back on and continued on. All right, uh, I, I show that uh, you, you signed up uh, and volunteered on April the 19th of 68, is that correct? That sounds probably pretty close, yeah. All right. Um, when did you get to Vietnam? Got to Vietnam the first part of uh, September of 1968. Where did you land? When we got there, we landed Camera, uh, Camera, Cameron, Cameron Bay. Bay. Cameron Bay in Vietnam. And on a map, that would be right in this area right here. And while uh, our cameraman is Tom Lee, and Tom has helped me with a number of these uh, interviews, he's from Cincinnati and is from a military family, and he does a great job. So while he's looking at the while he's looking at the uh, camera, at the map, why don't you go ahead and show us some of the places where you were, and then we'll talk a little bit more about each one. Okay, we, we like I said, we arrived at Cameron Bay, went through our processing and stuff, and got assigned to our units. Uh, from there, I joined my unit at a place called Bami Tuit, right in this area here, is where I joined our unit. Uh, I also spent time in Play Coup, that's where our big place uh, base camp was for the 4th Infantry Division was Play Coup. Also spent time in uh, Contum and Docto. So I was all in the 
anywhere in the Central Highlands area of Vietnam. That would be two Corps, is what the military called it, and that was the Central Highlands. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the first place you went after you landed was uh, Bambi Tuit? Bambi Tuit was the first place I went after I landed. And you said you joined your unit. What was the, uh, the designation of your unit? Okay, I was uh, C Company, 1st Battalion, 22nd Infantry, 4th Infantry Division. Uh, tell me that again. C Company, 1st Company, Battalion. Battalion, 22nd Infantry, 4th Infantry Division. When you, when you uh, were assigned to Unit C, um, did you have any of your fellows with you that uh, you had gone through any of the basic trainings with? Yep, yeah, uh, there were several of us that went through uh, the advanced infantry training together. We we went over there together. Uh, might not have stayed together in the same units. Once we got over to Cameron Bay, we you know some of us got sent to other infantry divisions, and uh, but I did fly over with some that I went through training with. Did you serve over there with any of your buddies? Uh, nope, none of the ones that I went through training with were was I with. Nope. Did you come across any fellows from the Cincinnati area that you knew? You know, it's it's funny. Uh, before I got assigned to my unit, when I went into Cameron Bay, a uh, big air base there, uh, they have people unloading the planes. So, of course, the new people, when they come, they take them to they help unload the planes and stuff. And that's so that's what I did. And it's funny. I went to a guy working for the Air Force in charge. He was uh, in charge of unloading these planes. And he lived about two blocks from me in St. Bernard, and he was the first guy I met when I got there. He said, you hang with me, you don't have to unload these planes, you just hang with me. So that's that's what we did. That was so, nice. Yeah, but it, it, you know, it's just a funny story that the first guy you meet is a guy you grew up with, lived two blocks down the street uh, uh, that was in the Air Force. That's not gonna happen very often. No, it's not, no. Oh. Although if you ask my family, they said no matter where I go, I run into somebody I know, so. It's a small world yeah, sometimes. Yes, it is. So, uh, what, uh, how long were you there before you went to the, your first assignment? How long was I at Cameron Bay? Yeah. Probably a matter of days, two or three days, just for them to do the processing, issue your equipment and stuff like that. So, just a matter of days. What did you do at uh, Bombay Tuit? Okay, that's where I joined the unit. And <clears throat> uh, I no sooner got there, and we ran uh, what they called, what the fourth, or what our unit anyway called Green Eyes. Uh, they were like a two or three men groups went out as like an early warning for the main company uh, just to keep eye on, you know, uh, any activity in the area, you know, any Vietnamese, Viet Cong troops in the area. We weren't supposed to make any contact or anything. We were supposed to just be an early warning system, you know, radio back to the company, hey, there's movement out here in this valley or whatever, and let them know what's going on. And so I was probably there a day or two, and I got sent on one of those what we called green eyes. So that's like a <clears throat> that's like a reconnaissance. Yeah, like a reconnaissance patrol. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And when did you when did you do that? Were you do that in the daytime or nighttime? Uh, well, you'd go out for like two or three days at a time. You would usually leave early in the morning. And you would go set up somewhere, try not to be seen, of course, uh, because you. Know, we weren't supposed to make contact or anything, just observe. And uh, so you go out and then we'd spend two or three days out there and then go back to the, the main unit. And then uh, they did that constantly. You know, they tend three or four out at a time, you know, in each direction. And- uh, How were you dressed when you go out as a green eyes? Uh, just our regular, you know, jungle fatigues, and just our regular uniform. When you were out there for two or three days, what, uh, what accommodations did you have for sleeping and eating and the like? Well, we, we had our, you know, our ponchos and stuff, you know, to help keep warm or keep dry if we need it, if it rained. And we took sea ration with us, you know, to eat. How was the weather there? The weather, most of the time, was hot as can be. Certain times of the year, during the monsoon season, it would rain and rain and rain. And it, you never saw any rain like that here before, but it was awful wet. <laughs> well, let me take your mind back to when you first landed uh, in Vietnam. Uh, got out of the got out of the plane. Were you, were you, uh, um, 
influenced by how hot it was or by any odors uh, when you got off the plane? Well, it was awful hot. And you say, you just think to yourself, boy, this is going to be rough being hot like this, carrying all this equipment stuff around. But I guess you eventually get used to it because uh, I don't remember really being so bad after, you know, but you, when you first get there, you say, boy, it's hot over here, you know. When you go out for your two or three day uh, uh, ventures as Green Eyes, uh, how much uh, equipment did you have to carry weight wise? Uh, well, you carried your own uh, ammo for whatever kind of weapon you were carrying and you always carried, usually somebody would have a machine gun with them and so you would always carry extra M60 machine gun ammo also. You would carry your, you know, three or four hand grenades. So you carried quite a bit of equipment with you. And did you carry the machine gun at all? I, I never carried a machine gun. When I was stationed over there, I had an M79 grenade launcher, is what I carried when I was in Vietnam. Uh, and <clears throat> how many grenades did you have to carry with your launcher? Uh, I probably carried, I don't know, 15 or 20. They had a vest like it. You could put them down in, had places to put the ammo in. You know, it wasn't a whole lot, so. So you had <clears throat> you had yourself carrying a grenade launcher. Did you have a fellow carrying a machine gun? Mm-hmm. And did somebody carry extra ammunition for the machine gun? Yes, yeah. Usually everybody carried a little bit of ammunition for the machine gun. So did you do that too? Yes, yes. So you got all your hand grenades, you got the grenade launcher, you got ammunition for the machine gun. Correct. What, what else did you have? Well, our food, uh, like I said, our ponchos and stuff for sleeping and keeping dry. So, you know. It, How was the food? Uh, you got used to it. At the beginning, it wasn't so good, and there were some that was better than others. When they opened up the sea ration box, everybody fought for the good stuff because <laughs> there was some stuff that was pretty nasty. Some of the guys have told me that uh, some of the sea rations were from the Second World War. I think they might have been, but uh, but there were some of them like uh, beef and potatoes wasn't so bad, and there was some kind of turkey loaf wasn't so bad, but there were some green beans and something. It was... It was nasty. Nobody, nobody wanted that. Everybody looked for the sea rations that had the fruit in it too, because it was always good to get the fruit. The fruit was always good. They canned fruit, so everybody fought for that. <laughs> when you were out in your reconnaissance operations, did you get into any villages, or were you just on the uh, outskirts of villages? Uh, well, when we went on those green eyes, we weren't near any villages. Now, when we were moving as a, a complete unit. Uh, we did pass through villages or on the outskirts uh, at times. Did you, I'd say the majority of the time, though, we were out in the middle of nowhere. Most of the time, you're just out in the jungle? Out in the jungle, yes, out in the middle of who knows where. How about the uh, animals, uh, vermin, snakes, anything like that? Yep, ran into snakes several times. Uh, and there is a funny story talking about running into animals. We were on one of these green eyes and we would take turns, there was three of us, so we'd take turns sleeping and watching, you know, for a couple hours at a time. So it's getting to be about dawn and here's somebody, it sounds like somebody walking down the hill and I think to myself, oh no, we've, you know, we were seen here, you know, we're gonna run into some stuff now. And I, about that time, you know, it's just getting to be where it's a little bit of light, a little bit of dark, and I look up and about for me to Tom away, there's a bear. I see him, he sees me, I jump one way and he takes off running the other way. <laughs> As well, needless to say, there wasn't no sleeping for me the rest of the day or anything because I could just see that bear, you know. But that was just a funny story, you know, running into a bear like that. Well, did you have any uh, confrontations with the enemy uh, when you were out on your green eye operations? Uh, never never did have any uh, contact with anybody when we were on green eye operations. Uh, one time we did have an enemy patrol probably walk past us maybe 50 yards away from us, but they didn't know we were there and uh, they just went on and things were fine. Well, after you completed your re reconnaissance and you went back to, to base, uh, what kind of report did you have to give to your uh, officers? Well, we just report anything we saw, any activity, like I said, that one patrol the one time, you know, or if there was no activity, just, you know, uh, what the terrain was like, you know, you know, was it 
pretty easy to get through and things like that. So did you uh, did your 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 uh, unit move as a unit from any place uh, back in the jungle before you went to play coup? Uh, yeah, we moved we moved all the time. We didn't stay at one place for too often. Uh, you know, a week or two here, a week or two there. We were moving most of the time to different fire bases. Uh, most of the time, they were old fire bases that were had already been set up and occupied by, by other units and then abandoned when they moved out. And a couple times we would set up our own new uh, fire bases, you know, start from scratch, you know, clearing off the hill, clearing the trees, the bush and brush and everything out of the way and setting up new fire bases. But we would move pretty regularly, yes. For somebody that's uh, not going to be familiar with the uh, uh, military terminate, uh, terms, uh, what was a fire base? Okay, fire base was more or less like a, I guess you'd call it a, a more permanent uh, base for you to hang out. But like I said, it might only be two, three, two, two or three weeks we'd be there. But it was usually up on a hill where you'd overlook, you know, the area. You know, you'd have good visibility and see what's going on down below in the valleys and stuff. And uh, so it'd be easy to see if, you know, there was anybody coming or, uh, you know, what was going on. But when you set up your fire base, did you also set up, set up or were there already uh, living accommodations there? Well, if we moved into a, an old fire base that somebody had set up, the bunkers and everything were already there and we just, you know, took over. When you set up a brand new one, you got to dig your own bunkers and s set up from scratch, you know. And usually we would have artillery with us also and they would set up their art or mortars. They would set up their mortars and stuff too at the same time. Uh, well, at, uh, did you, were you at any uh, more permanent fire bases when you were there at Bambi Tuit? Uh, Bambi Tuit was a, a, a pretty small fire base. Uh, you, I guess yeah. Doc Toe, around the Doc Toe area was probably the biggest and biggest fire base that I spent time on and uh, probably spent more time there than any other place. Uh, our big fire base, as where the whole 4th Division was out of, was in uh, Play Coup. Now, we went back to Play Coup. We were supposed to go back for a three or four day R&R, &R, they called rest and relax, you know, from the field. Well, we got in there one night and the next morning we left out again. And that was the only time until I got wounded that I saw Play Coup <laughs> until I, you know, left. But other than play coup, you say Doc Toe was your biggest fire base that yes. you went yep. into. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any uh, contact with the enemy uh, at any time during uh, Bambi to it? Uh, not at Bambi to it. Didn't have any any uh, any contact with anything at Doc Toe. We had some, uh, I guess VC, Viet Cong, whatever, snooping around, and they would fire. You know, just trying to, I guess get us to fire back to get our locations more accurate and stuff, but nothing nothing major at that time. More harassment. More harassment, right, yeah. So did you go to Doc Toe from Bambi to it, or did you, uh, when did you go to, ta uh, what was it, Con, Contum? Contum. Uh, they were all in the same, same general time frame. Like I said, we didn't spend time at one place for two or three weeks, so I don't remember if I was at I was probably a Doc Toe first and then Contum somewhere afterwards. I think Contum uh, was later, uh, right before we came home probably, right before I came home, after we, after I got wounded and came home. What were your duties uh, when you were at Doc Toe? Well, it's the same thing when you were stationed. If you were worn out on one of those green eyes, you were, you know, you had perimeter duty at night and during the day, you know, so you would take two, three hour, four hour shifts, you know, and uh, just alternate all day and all night, you know. Tell, tell us about your perimeter duties. What did those consist of? Well, just keeping watch for the whole company, making sure, you know, that uh, you're not being snuck up on by any of the enemy troops. Uh, just make sure you know what's going on, you know. How did you protect the perimeter of the fire bases? Well, you had the machine guns out there, the M79s, you had your mortars, you know, you had your M16, you had wiring, Constantino wiring around the whole thing. 
uh, probably several layers of it. You'd probably have some and then have, you know, a gap in between and have some more. Uh, so you have plenty of Constantino wire. Did you have any uh, enemy in infiltrating any of your fire bases while you were there? Never did. Like I said, most of the time it was just harassment, you know, trying to look for places and stuff, and uh, but never actually had anybody infiltrate any of our fire bases. We would have Claymore mines out too, set out in front of the Constantina or in between the Constantina. Well, if you were going to leave a fire base and go elsewhere, what did you do about the Claymore mines? Did you retrieve them? We retrieved the Claymore mines. The Constantina and stuff would all stay there, but uh, the Claymore mines, we would retrieve those and bring those with us. Well, t tell me about walking around the jungle uh, when, when you're out here on your, you know, your green eye patrols. Uh, what precautions did you take as far as uh, uh, booby traps or anything? Well, like yeah, you always had to be on the lookout. Uh, we ran into, discovered many booby traps. You know, luckily, uh, while I was there, no one actually tripped a booby trap or, uh, you know, we saw them ahead of time and were able to disarm them or go around them. Uh, Give us an example of uh, the types of booby traps you would see. Well, you'd, had a, you'd have the holes <laughs> dug with the bamboo spikes in the bottom, so uh, if you'd step on that hole, you know, you'd go down and them bamboo spikes would get your legs and uh, they usually had, you know, cow dung or whatever on it. So you're getting infected and stuff. Uh -huh. uh, they had different uh, swinging, same thing, spikes and stuff on swinging, you know, hook the trees. It would, if you tripped the trip wire, it would swing from the tree and, you know, eat you up. Did, did uh, any of those get tripped, but nobody got hurt? Uh, we we tripped some manually. Uh, but intentionally? Intentionally, yeah. We found them and went ahead and tripped them manually. Uh, so, you know, so someone behind us that didn't see them, you know, went accidentally get injured or, or killed. Let's talk a little bit about what went on when you were back uh, home in your fire base. Uh, how did you eat? Uh, uh, a lot of times they would fly hot food into us. Helicopters would bring in hot hot food to us whenever they could. If they couldn't, we were stuck with the sea rations. But most of the time back at fire bases, they were able to chopper in hot food to us, which okay. was pretty good after eating sea rations, you know, when you're out in the boonies. So, uh, How about your, your personal care? How often did you have a chance to shower or bathe or whatever? Uh, most of the time you bathe if you went through a stream or something. Uh, they did have showers, but at the, at the base camp, uh, didn't shower a whole lot. You just cleaned up as best you can, put water in your steel pot, you know, soap up and rinse off and stuff. Not not too much showers. So when you're out for two or three or so days on your green eye reconnaissance, you didn't have a chance to clean up or anything? Yeah, you didn't do much of anything there, no, because you were trying to stay as still as possible, as quiet as possible, you know, so you wouldn't be discovered. But it's hot in the devil over there and you got your uniform on. Aren't yep. You, aren't you sweating a lot? Yeah, you're sweating a lot. Yeah, so it's good to get back to base camp where you can clean up a little bit. But Were you able to uh, wash or launder your, your uniforms and stuff? You could usually wash them out, get a little bit of water and wash them out, yeah. How about, uh, oh, this is something as simple as a haircut. Uh, did you get haircuts while you were there? Every now and then they would they would fly a barber out to the base camp. So if we were to one of our base camp, they'd fly a barber out and uh, you get a haircut. Every now and then they'd uh, have a dentist come out and check your teeth uh, and things like that. So yeah, every now and then they'd, they'd bring people out to take care of stuff like that, depending on where you were. Did you have any health problems? Uh, you, you told us you got injured, but before that, did you have any health problems? Any diseases or anything from the environment? Well, I think uh, I was on a couple of patrols and I started to really get weak and tired. And I think that's when the malaria that I really hit me when I got came back. I think that's when that all started because that would just knock you out. And I did later on, you know, towards the end there, just going on a normal recon and stuff. You get all wore out and, you know, exhausted. And I think that's where the malaria started. Well, we've talked about you carrying a grenade launcher. Did you carry any other weapons on any of your green eye reconnaissance? Nope. All I carried was a grenade launcher. Well, tell us about the, the uh, occasion when you got injured. 
Okay, well, this was a, a big, uh, big operation. It was several, several different companies and several different uh, divisions were going to sweep through this valley. There was a... What was the name of the valley or the area? I believe it was, it was in the Central Highlands. Uh, it was west of Contum. And if I remember correctly, it was Kudon Valley. C-U-D-O-N, Kudon Valley. And like I said, that was west of Contum, close to the Cambodian border. And that we had intelligence that the uh, Viet Cong were uh, coming down Cambodia and into Vietnam and uh, building a big uh, bunker complex and bringing supplies and stuff, stuff. And we assumed they were getting ready for a big offensive against us, against Contum is what we thought. So it was our job to find this big bunker complex and try to neutralize it and cut off the supply route into that area and so that's what we were doing when i got wounded i was on the uh, the initial uh i guess platoon or whatever that was going ahead of the main unit to to check out the area first and when we got so far away from the unit we got ambushed and we got cut off from the main main unit uh how many guys were in your uh in unit at that time that was ambushed uh, probably six or eight of us, I guess. Right. And uh, so we were, they, they had a handheld um, mine they blew up on us. They they detonated themselves, you know, when we got to a certain point. Then there were snipers also there and machine gunners and B-40 rockets. So we had quite a fight on our hands when we got down there. Uh, so you six or eight guys were are attacked with all of this uh, yeah we're kind of pinned down and then uh when they heard the racket up above uh some more people from the the unit came down to try to give us assistance and one of my good buddies uh sorry he got he got killed uh, coming down to help us well he he was one of the fellows that came to render assistance. He right. was a part of your first six or Right, eight. right. He was one that came down. To, I don't think any of the ones that came down on the initial movement, uh, I think probably all of us got wounded, some more serious than other, but none of us none of us got killed. How did you get wounded? Uh, had that, that uh, mine blew up on me and I had shrapnel, I don't know, in my legs, in my face, in my arms, just a little bit of everywhere. No, I know that you got a, a bronze star. Is that where you uh, were active when you later was awarded the bronze star? Yes. So tell me about what you did to uh, merit the uh, um, the bronze star. Being well, we got awarded. wounded. Of course, we fought back and stuff, and uh, tried to drag some of my buddies <clears throat> that were wounded. You know, tried to drag them out of harm's way. <laughs> Harm's way. Well, what 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 was the environment that you guys were in when uh, when you got ambushed? Was this was this out in rice paddies or was this? No, this was in the middle of the jungle. It was in a jungle area. Um, were you able to save some of your buddies through your conduct? I think so. Like I said, none of us on the initial movement were we were all wounded, I believe, but. Uh, none of none of us died. Some of us wounded pretty seriously, uh, and just tried to get them to safety. And uh, finally, after being down there, it felt like forever, and it was probably only a couple hours. Uh, we called in artillery, calling it in awful close to our position. You could hear it cracking off the tops of the trees. It was coming in so close to us because that's how close the ambush was. Mm -hmm. uh, we finally, you know, got rid of the threat, and we were able to get back up the hill to the uh, to the to the main unit where they had cut out a LZ for the choppers to come in to uh, take us to the hospital. You know, get us. We had to get to an open area to get the choppers in there. Well, they 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 cut an open area in the jungle. It was a very small area they cut. Uh, and so we finally got up there, and that's where we get. I finally got my uh, medical aid. 
So when we got back up there. Uh, Were you able to walk up there? Yeah, I was able to walk, yeah. Well, this article says that uh, um, you were engaged uh, by uh, unknown size of North Vietnamese force and uh, you were moving forward, uh, was severely wounded at the moment of initial contact. Undaunted by your wounds, you crawled through the intense enemy fire uh, to eight other <coughs> members of your pl platoon who were also wounded. Now, you told me there were six or eight of you. Did all six or eight of you get wounds? I, th I think as far as I remember, we did. Uh, so you personally carried several men from the battlefield. Well, it was more or less drug them from the battlefield or drug them out of harm's way. Uh, actually, to get them up the hill, it was the, the guys that were coming down to help us, to mm -hmm. assist. They did most of, the, most of the carrying and carrying up the hill or helping us up the hill because we were all is that when your buddy got killed when he got he got killed as he was coming down right after the initial attack on us they heard the fire and he got a squad together real quick and they came down and he got he got uh kind of bad with a machine gun mm-hmm but uh did you help to move him out of the i, I personally battery? didn't help move him no uh he wasn't moved until after the threat was subsided a little bit and uh, then we were all able to one way or another get back up the hill. How long did this entire encounter um, take? Like I said it's, it seemed like it was all day because it was starting to get dark but the jungle was so thick so what it was probably only two or three hours I mean but two or three hours when you're under fire is a long long Seems time. Like a lifetime, doesn't yeah it? it sure did it sure did. So uh, you were removed from the area by helicopter, medevac? Yes, okay. medevac by helicopter. What, what kind of uh, helicopter was it? It was a, a Huey. That's what they used for the medicate. They had to make several trips because they could only get a, you know, two or three or four of us on at one time. So they had to make a couple trips. Was the helicopter under fire? Uh, at the time, no, it wasn't movement? under fire. Everything was kind of settled out at that time. Now, could you tell when your your uh, enemy opponent was uh, Viet Cong as opposed to uh, North Vietnamese? Were they dressed the same? Well, usually uh, Vietnamese army actually had uniforms, where the Viet Cong didn't have uniforms. They would just wear their civilian attire or whatever. So you could usually tell them that way if you, if you were able to see them. That North Vietnamese army actually had uniforms. Okay. They were they were more uh, formally dressed. While you were in this uh, in this battle where you got ambushed, uh, could you tell? Did you see any of the enemy at all? Yeah, we did. There was a sniper up in the tree, and off to where what would have been my left, there was a a couple couple guys over there with B forty rockets. In fact, they they fired one towards us, and it landed probably twenty yards in front of us, and it was a dud. Thank goodness. So, but, uh, and then there was behind us, there's a big, huge tree, I remember. And when they cut us off with this uh, initial contact, they surrounded this is what they did. This guy with machine gun was behind that tree. And it, we, he was our biggest threat, I think, because we couldn't get to him. And that's who ended up killing my buddy when he came down the hill, the guy with the machine gun. But eventually, he also got killed. So, and that kind of, I think, when we took him out finally, that kind of settled things down again. Okay. Uh, did you see him during or after, uh, whether he was a North Vietnamese or a VC? He was a North, he was a North Vietnamese uh, regular army. Mm -hmm. I didn't see him on the way up the hill. He was laying there dead. All right, so uh, uh, they evacuate you from from this uh, ambush area, uh, the Kudan Valley. Uh huh. Uh, and they took you where? Uh, went to the hospital back at our base pa uh, base camp in Pleiku. And what did they do for you there? Okay, they started removing the shrapnel, and my biggest injury for me is why I got sent home was my eye. Uh, I had shrapnel that went behind my eye. And uh, 
the, the eye doctor I go to today, and they told me over there that they're, I'm lucky I didn't go blind at, you know, a centimeter one way or the other, and I'd have probably lost my, my eye. Lost so they took me there and took care, you know, what they could, uh, getting all the shrapnel out. My lip was all, well, it was just shattered. And uh, I had shrapnel all over my face, my legs, my arms, my hands. Uh, well, who treated you there? Was, uh, was there a combat nurse or were there uh, There were doctors? There was a doctor. I remember the guy's name. It was, he, was a, he was a colonel. And I take that back. He was a major, uh, Major Russell. I remember his name. Uh, he was a doctor that took care of me. He was from Texas. What causes you to remember that? I, I don't know. It's just one of the things I remember. I looked up and saw his name tag and he was taking care of me. He was real nice, you know, real calm, made me calm and uh, told me, you know, they'd take care of me. And How long were you at the hospital did. there to play coup? Uh, I was probably there three or four days. And from there, they sent me to Camp Zama Army Hospital in Japan. Camp what? Zama. Z-A-M-A, -A, Zama, okay. Camp Zama Army Hospital. That was in Tokyo. Some base there, I don't remember the name of the base, but. How long were you at uh, Zama? Uh, I was probably there another week or so, I guess, maybe. Were you treated by nurses or doctors? Uh, both, nurses and doctors there. Uh, were they uh, American or Japanese? They were, they were American, they were all military. Um, how long were you there? A week or so. And, and where did you go? Uh, from there, I went to uh, Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. How long were you at Walter Reed? Uh, just a matter of a, a few days, I think. Uh, I, more or less there just being checked out and uh, making sure I was okay. Uh, well, how, were you, how were your wounds by the time they you were, were transferred from... Zama. They were pretty good. Uh, my eye was a little messed up still, but the shrapnel and the stitches, I still had stitches in my lip and in my face and stuff where they had stitched me up a little bit, but looking pretty good actually, considering. So they just checked you out there at Walter Reed for right. a few days, and then right. where, did they, where did you go? Okay, from there I came home on convalescent leave, came back to Cincinnati here, went down to my, my home in St. Bernard. How long were you at home? Uh, I was supposed to be there for a couple of weeks. Well, it turned out that's when I really, really got sick with the malaria. And so we contacted the military, to see what I should do, if I should go to Fort Knox. And so be it, I went to, uh, they sent me to the Veterans Hospital there in, here in Cincinnati uh, to see what, what was going on. And at first they, they didn't know what I had. They were speculating that I had had this and had this. They thought I had cancer, some type of cancer. So I was so relieved when they finally came back and said, you have malaria, you know. Even though I was sick as a dog, I was happy to hear it was just malaria. Uh -huh. So, and like I said, I was, I was one sick puppy. Uh, I mean, there was days where I couldn't eat. I'd hear the trays coming down the hall to feed us and just thinking of food or smelling the food, I'd get physically sick. That's how, that's how bad I was. Uh, and I was like that for several days. But after once I, they got me on some medicines and stuff, I started feeling good. Well, then they couldn't feed me enough after that. <laughs> so Made up for lost time. Yeah, made up for lost time. So then I guess I was supposed to go to Fort Knox and uh, when I went to the VA. So I guess Fort Knox was getting a little anxious. I wasn't down there yet. So they says, uh, we, if he's okay to travel, we need to need you to send him down here. So what they did, they did, they sent me down to the hospital, Ireland Army Hospital, Fort Knox, Kentucky. And uh, I was only there a day or two. They checked me out, make sure everything was fine. And then after that, they assigned me to a unit down there at uh, Fort Knox. Well, how long were you at the hospital there at the VA? Uh, I was probably there a good, good couple of weeks, I guess. And when you, uh, how did you get to Fort Knox from Cincinnati? Uh, drove down, or I didn't drive down. Uh, I guess my family drove me down. Took me to the hospital down there. Well, let me uh, take you back to when you got back to see your mom for the first time after coming back from Vietnam. Where was that? 
Is yeah. that when you had your convalescence? Yes, when I was on home on convalescent leave, yeah. And when she saw you and the, and the injuries you had, what was her reaction? Well, she was just glad to see me, big old hug, and just glad that I was home. And, and at least in one piece. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, uh, what's the status with your, uh, with your future wife at that time? Well, uh, did you see her at all during that convalescence? Uh, yes, I did. In fact, when I was in uh, Japan, I got to call home, and I I did call my parents, and I called my Joyce. my girlfriend at the time. Joyce. Yeah, and uh, I got to talk to them from Japan, let them know that I was okay, and uh, so. Did you did you send mail and receive mail while you were over in Vietnam? Yes, all the time. Yep, anytime we could sit and write a letter, that's what most of the guys did, sat and write letters, and they were pretty good with getting mail to us, you know, they'd chop it out whenever they could when we were, you know, as long as we were at a base camp and not out in the middle of the jungle somewhere, if we were at a base camp, they would they would get it to us. Did anybody uh, monitor uh, the letters that you sent out? No, not as far as I know, no. Was was it pretty well understood that you weren't to give any information in, about where you were and what you were doing in the letters you sent home? Uh, I don't think they really cared if you let people know, you know, where you were, like, you know, you're around Contum or Docto or Play Coup or something like I don't think they minded that. I don't think they wanted you to get into a whole lot of detail, though. Mm -hmm. So uh, you go to Fort Knox. And uh, what was your assignment at Fort Knox? Fort Knox, I was assigned to a basic training unit. Uh, I was an AI, an assistant instructor. I assisted the drill instructors who, you know, went to school to be a drill instructor. I basically was one of their assistants, helped teach classes and uh, do you, things like that. Were you one of the guys that did the mental, mental uh, stress on the uh, uh, new recruits? I probably did, yes, sir. <laughs> Yep, I sure did. Uh, you, you had learned well from your own drill instructor. Right. I don't think I was as bad as some of mine because I knew what it was like. But uh, mm -hmm. but so it's probably you, a good thing because you know they need to get used to that kind of pressure and stuff. So, what were your accommodations there at Fort Knox? Uh, when I at Fort Knox, I lived in the, I actually lived in the barracks with the with the basic trainees. I had a s separate room. Um, I had a separate room in the barracks. Uh, how was the food? With the troops, food at the it wasn't so bad uh, at the mess hall. They had they had pretty good food. And I suppose you really enjoyed Fort Knox because you could take a bath or a shower whenever you wanted. To. Right, and I could come home on weekends, which I did a lot. I came home just about every weekend. Did you uh, see Joyce on those weekends? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And me and a buddy, we would, uh, he had a car down there. I didn't have a car, so we would uh, drive back and forth. And he picked me up on the way back down. And we... Well, what was your rank uh, when you went into service? What was your rank? Okay, well, when I went in, I was a private E1 or whatever. And when you got to Fort Knox, by that time, what were you? Uh, I was a Spec 4. Did you have any battlefield commissions? No. <clears throat> and um, did you were you discharged uh, from Fort Knox? Yes, I was discharged from Fort Knox. Correct. And you was that uh, about April seventeenth of two thousand uh, nineteen seventy? Correct. Um, what did you do after discharge? Okay, uh, I went to work for the. U.S. Post Office. Where? Da uh, downtown Cincinnati. What did you do? I ran a sorting machine. It would sort the mail by uh, zip codes. Let her go past. You see the zip code. You type it in, and it would just continually go. You just did that for eight hours. <laughs> um, what? What did you do with uh, with Joyce uh, after you got discharged? Did you uh, ask her to marry you at any? particular time? Yep, we stayed together and uh, so I got out in 70 and we, we ended up getting married in 1971. Where'd you get married? We got married uh, 
St. Aloysius Church here in Cincinnati. It's in a small town, a suburb, Elmwood Place. There's a little town right next to St. Bernard where I grew up. I grew up in St. Bernard. She grew up in Elmwood Place, and that's the church we got married at. Did you go any place for a honeymoon? Uh, we went to, uh, what's the amusement park over there in Virginia? Can't think of it. Uh, Bush Gardens. Over by Williamsburg. Yeah, over by Williamsburg. That's where we went, correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, did, did Joyce have uh, siblings? Uh, she did. She had uh, three brothers, a stepbrother, and a stepsister. Um, how did you, uh, how did you like Joyce's parents? I liked her parents. Her, 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 uh, when we first got married, it was her dad and her stepmom, and I liked her dad. Her stepmom was wonderful. And then several years later, I met her real mom, and, uh, she was nice, real nice too, and, uh. Good. So when you and Joyce got married and you got back to the honeymoon, was she, did she work any place? Uh, she did. Uh, she worked, she co-op for Procter & Gamble while she was still in high school. <clears throat> then once she got out of high school, she continued to work for Procter & Gamble. So you're working for the post office and she's working at Procter? Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, then uh, we haven't talked about your family. Uh, when did you and Joyce start having children? Okay, our son was born in 1975. He was born in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. He was born while I was in the military over there. Well, that that makes me uh, get back into uh, your re-enlistment. Uh, what brought that about? Well, I had always planned on making a career out of the military. So even though I got out the first time, I wasn't really sure, you know, if I wanted to stay in or not, and then after I did get out, I said, you know, I should have should have stayed in there and made a career of this. And so after two and a half, three years thinking about it, I decided, well, I'm going back in and do this. And so I did. I went back in in 1973. I right, showed September 24 to 73. That sounds probably about right. And you signed up in Cincinnati. I signed up in Cincinnati back again. Back in the army again. Back in the army again. <laughs> Where'd they send you this time? Uh, I think for basic training, I went down to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, I believe. And sa same kind of basic training you same had Same kind before. of basic training I had before, yeah. Except it, this time, the drill sergeants weren't near as bad. They were still bad, but not near as bad as they used to be. They kind of <laughs> backed off a little bit, I think. Oh, that was good for you, right? Yeah. So uh, how long were you at Lenderwood? Uh, Probably same thing, uh, eight, ten weeks just for the training. Then where did you go? Uh, from there I came up to Fort Knox. Back to Fort Knox Back again? Back to Fort Knox again. I was in a uh, cavalry unit for some training. Which kind of training did you have in the cavalry unit? Uh, just on different vehicles and uh, M114s, M113s. Uh, were those tanks? No, they were small, small personnel carriers. Okay. They were. Uh, I was a couple different units down there. The last one I was at was uh, the 10th Cav. Years ago, they were known as the Buffalo Soldiers. That was the black army unit groups, the Buffalo Soldiers, uh -huh. where they had a unit where well, they weren't black anymore, of course, but uh, 10th Cav down there at Fort Knox. That's the unit I was assigned to before I went over to Germany. I don't know, Viet Knox. Uh, let's see, September. Probably six or so months, maybe, for the... For the cavalry training? Right, yeah. So, uh, were you married when you went over to uh, Germany? Yes, I was married when I went to Germany. Got married in uh, September 11th of 1971, and I went over to Germany and, uh, hmm, might have been around September of 73. So did she go with you? Uh, n not at the time. She didn't go over when we first went over. Uh, she came over, uh, 
she was about seven or eight months pregnant when she came over. She came over in 70, I, I take that back, I didn't go over there in 73, I went over in 75. 75 is when I went over. And that's and when your son was born. That's when my there. son, yeah, I went over in probably September. Some, I don't, I don't remember the dates exactly, somewhere probably around September, I think, and she came over like in November, and he was born at the end of November. What kind of accommodations uh, did you have there when she came over? Uh, living accommodations. Well, before she came, I was living in the barracks. But before she came over, I got a I got an apartment off post. Uh, so we had a little apartment, little one bedroom apartment. Was that uh, an apartment owned by a, a German person? Yes, it was. Uh, mm -hmm. Did they live there on site with you? Uh, the person that owned the building didn't. Uh, we actually lived, it was above a, a gas station repair shop, is the little apartment we lived in. And uh, the people that owned the building didn't live there, but they, they lived in the same town, but they didn't live in that building. Uh, did the uh, people that uh, operated the facilities below y your apartment, they speak English? Very little. Did you learn any German? Very little. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get along with the, uh, with the landlord? Didn't have much dealings, really. The landlord knew a little bit, enough for me and him to get by, you know. Uh -huh. uh, if we had a problem, we could call and he could come fix something, so. Uh, Did you have an allowance uh, pay-wise for your wife? Uh, we, had, we had an allowance for living off, off, off base for our apartment and stuff, yeah. Okay. So then your son's born while you're there? Correct. And did you stay in that apartment or did you move from that apartment? No, we stayed in that apartment the whole time I was over there. Uh, what did your wife do uh, over there during the day besides take care of your son? Take care of the son, uh, walk around town, uh, meet with other other guys' wives. You know, they would always get together and go shopping or just do whatever whatever women do. <laughs> what, 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 what was your boy's name? Uh, his name is Robert Christopher. He goes by Chris these days, but it, well, he always has. We always called him Chris. He goes by his middle name. So tell me a little bit about uh, Chris. Uh, what does he do now? Uh, he works for Kroger Company. Been with them for who? Probably twenty years or more. Is he, is he here in Cincinnati? He's here in Cincinnati. Correct. Is he married. He is married. Children? Uh, no children. What's but his wife's his name? His wife's name is Lynette. All right. Uh, did you have any other children while you were in Germany? No. How many when you got back? Nope. Just got the one son. Just the one son. Mm -hmm. uh, I showed that you uh, got out uh, the service that second time, July 21 of 78. Is that right? It sounds about right, yep. So did, uh, did you spend all your time uh, in Frankfurt before you were discharged? No. Uh, actually, I was in a small town called Budigen is where the town I was stationed at. What did you do there? Uh, I was in a cav unit and I was a track commander for a M551. It's a light uh, reconnaissance vehicle. <clears throat> What'd you do when you were in Frankfurt? Uh, never was in Frankfurt. Uh, like you I went? said, I was, I was in a small town called Budigen oh. is where I was stationed. So you went to Frankfurt, but you were actually... Yeah, Frankfurt's where my son was born, because okay. that's where the hospital was. All right. uh, but I was actually stationed in a small town called Budigen. Okay. So all your time over in Germany was there at Budigen? Yeah, correct. And uh, how, did, uh, how did you and the family get back to the States, and where did you come from to? Okay, we came from... Uh, went from Germany, flew out of Frankfurt into Cincinnati. We came home for leave for a little while. So we stayed here in Cincinnati for, I don't know, a couple weeks maybe, visiting and getting ready. And then we drove. My next duty assignment was down at Fort Bliss, Texas, down in El Paso, Texas. We drove down there, and that's where I spent the remainder of my time. I left Germany in 1977. And, and from 77 to 78, when I got out, I was stationed down at, at Fort Bliss, Texas. What were your duties at Fort Bliss? I was in another CAV outfit. What were your living accommodations? Was Joyce and, and uh, Chris with you? Yes, we had an apartment 
off post down there also yeah well uh, so you were you were discharged in 78 uh, what happened to your uh, d thoughts of being a lifetime well military after I had my son and the traveling and stuff my my wife Joyce she just re didn't really enjoy it. it wasn't her thing and so just decided it was better to go ahead and get out and uh, better than ruining a marriage. <laughs> so the two of you decided that you were going to resign just and uh, get out and, and then come back to Cincinnati. Come back to Cincinnati, correct. So uh, where where did you work when you came back to Cincy? Uh, let's see, that would have been '78. Uh, I went to work for a chemical company called W.R. Grace Company. Doing and, what? Uh, I started out as a security guard and just to get in the door, the guy that uh, hired me was an old military guy. So he hired me as a security guard and a short time later, probably worked at that job for less than a year. And I was promoted to an assistant foreman and eventually worked my way up to a plant foreman for the facility there. How long was your career with uh, W.R. Grace? Uh, I was there a little over 26 years. And did you live here in Cincinnati all lived, that time? Lived here in Cincinnati, correct. Where were you living? Uh, we lived right here at this house. We bought this house in 1978, the same year I started working there, we bought this house. And we are now at 1644 Sanborn Drive. Correct. Uh, and what's this? A suburb? What's yeah, it's Redding, okay. Redding, Ohio. So after you uh, after you left Grace, um, what did you do? Well, uh, I DJed as a hobby for about 40 years, uh, doing weddings proms, you know, school dances, stuff like that. I would do that a lot on the weekends. Uh, also did a lot for St. Bernard High School. I was president of their boosters group for a couple terms. I did a lot for their athletics. I, uh, I was the PA announcer for the girls basketball for 12 years. I kept the scorebook for about the same amount of years for the boys. So I did various jobs for different uh, sporting events, you know, for the for the school down there. And did you, uh, since you were such a good person in uh, in track, did you go to see the uh, school boys uh, or girls engage in track? I, I have several times when uh, they, had, they had a couple teams back in the 60s, uh, 70s, 80s that went to state and uh, whenever I was available, I would go up to state and watch them run or district regionals, whatever they were running, mm -hmm. especially to cross country. <clears throat> so but after you left Grace, uh, did you have a paying job other than doing your DJ? No, nope, I was, when I retired, I completely retired. When did you completely retire? Uh, January 2nd, 2004. Well, let, let me uh, ask you, um, Chris is is growing up when you get back here to Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Did uh, did Joyce uh, work outside the home uh, while he was growing up at all? Uh, when he was growing up, she stayed home and took care of him. Uh, and after a bit, I guess maybe I don't know if it was when he was out of high school or he might have still been in high school. She went back to work again. She went back to P&G. But she did stay home and raise him. Okay. And then at a certain point, she did go back. When you were at Grace, uh, you were playing foreman. Uh, was that a daytime job or? No, uh, it was swing shift. We changed every seven days. Work day shift seven days, off two days, work second shift two day, seven days, off two, then work night shift seven days, off three, just rotate. Well, well, isn't that hard to get your body uh, acclimated to sleeping and being awake? It was a killer. I hated it. <laughs> I hated it, but that's the way they ran, and if you're going to work there, that's what you had to do. So, uh, besides your your bronze star. Put them on your knee. 
Pardon? Set it on your knee so it's stable. Thank you. Keep talking. So this is your bronze star you got. When did you actually get the medal itself? Uh, I think I actually got the medal. I guess it was following me around the world after I got wounded. Uh, because I didn't actually get the bronze bronze star and the purple heart I was stationed down at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And it, it showed up down there and uh, they presented it to me down there to one of the formations. You also uh, were, were awarded a purple heart. When did you get that? Uh, that I was awarded that at the same time. Uh, it was for the action on April 3rd, 1969 in Vietnam. And I actually received that also down at Fort Knox at the same time I received my Bronze Star. Bronze Star. All right. And we have the, a discharge. I'll show it to you first. Yep, that's my honorable discharge from the United States Army. Uh, well, from which period? I think that's from the second period, I believe. One swear to it. Uh, on the 21st day of July, 1978. Yep, that's second time. Yep. That's second time. Yep. Right. Um, now we've got a photograph here. Uh, tell me if I've uh, got a lot of glare or if I can change this. I'm showing this picture of you. When was that taken? Uh, that was taken probably the first time I went into military. So that was probably back in 1968 sometime. And what, what is this called? Uh, that's my infantry cord. Uh, different branches of the service have different colors. Infantry happens to be blue. So that's my blue infantry cord. All right. And the, uh, the ribbon across uh, okay. your chest on the left side. That ribbon there is just a national defense ribbon. Everyone that goes into the military receives that that award, the national defense ribbon. Marksman. Pardon? I see a marksman badge. Yeah, probably probably a expert for for rifle. Uh, that yeah. That's that's below the ribbon we were talking about. Correct. When did you uh, get the marksman's? Uh, that? Got that when I went through basic training the first time. Got that for being export expert marksman with the rifle. <clears throat> I got another funny story if you want to hear it about. It. I said those medals followed me around the world. I got another another funny story about around the world while I was in Vietnam. My sister Donna. She was a Girl Scout selling Girl Scout cookies. And I says, huh, I'll be the nice big brother. I'll sell some cookies over here in Vietnam to my buddies for. So I did. I asked all my buddies, you want to buy some Girl Scout cookies for my sister? You know, pay me when they get here. No problem. I'll pay for them up front. You pay me when they get here. They said, okay. So I order all these cookies, something like 360 boxes of cookies I order. <laughs> so I order these cookies. Well, meantime, this is when we got in into all the stuff, you know, we got into battle and we all got wounded and got sent here and got sent there and everything. So I've got all these cookies. I'm in the hospital and play coup. Here these cookies start coming while I'm in the hospital. So I take these cookies from play coup. I give them to the Red Cross. I said, here, give these cookies out to the guys. You know, I can't do nothing with them. You know, the guys that bought them, they're gone. You know, they're in different places. So I gave them cookies. So I go from there, I go to Japan. Here come more cookies, follow me to Japan in the hospital. So I take those cookies, I say, give them to the Red Cross, give these out to the guys. Okay. So I go to Walter Reed, here come more cookies, follow me to Walter Reed, same thing. I give them out, you know, say, hey, give these to the guys, I can't use them. I go home on convalescent leave, here come cookies. So, <laughs> so I give them out to family and stuff at home. I get down to Fort Knox at the hospital down there. Here come more cookies. So the same thing I said, here, just give these out to whoever. So those cookies that I ordered from my sister followed me all around the world. I mean, everywhere I went, here come them cookies. <laughs> but my sister was number one salesman that year for selling cookies. 
it was just a funny story, you know, is that uh, <laughs> they followed me all over. You, you think somebody would take them and eat them or, you know, whatever, but nope, here they came. They came and followed yeah, you. Yeah, my boy. mom and the, the school, the uh, they took care of the charges. They packed them all up and paid to have them shipped and stuff. Uh, and, uh, yep, they followed me around the world. So, yep. Uh, you know, we've been here for... She was. Uh, we've been here for almost two hours talking about you, hour and a half ish. Uh, is there anything we haven't talked about? Any s stories like you just told us that uh, you think somebody a year from now might be interested in knowing about you or your uh, family? I don't think so. Uh, I guess I'm sad that I haven't kept in contact with a lot of guys I was in Vietnam with. I've tried to keep in contact with a couple of them, and for a while I did, and then they kind of got a little. I don't know if they got depressed and stuff, withdrawn. They just didn't want to talk to people no more. So I kind of lost contact with them. Now, people in Germany, uh, I'm still in contact with a lot of them, gone to several reunions. So I'm glad of that because- uh, Where do you have these reunions? Uh, they have them different places every year. They try to move them so people from different parts of the country can get to them. They've had them in Washington, D.C., down in Georgia. They've had them out in Illinois, out in Colorado. Texas. They try to move them around so people from different parts of the country don't have to travel so far. And uh, When do they have these? Every two or three years? Uh, every year, usually. Every year? Yeah. Uh, a lot of times they used to have them in the summer, but it got to be some places like down Fort Bliss, we would have one, or down Fort Benning, Georgia. It gets so hot and some of the older people. So now we're starting to have them later on in the fall and into the early winter. Like I think this year is going to be down at Fort Bliss, Texas in November, so. Well, how is your health now as far as uh, any of your battle wounds or your malaria? Uh, haven't had any trouble with malaria, so I guess the doctor told me you either get it real bad and then you're usually good or you get a slight case and then you carry it on for life. I had the real bad case and never had any problems since. Uh, Everything seemed to heal up good. I got some small scars places. My eye, my eye doctor, every time he sees me every year, he, he's just amazed because he, he, he takes a picture of it and he can see where, uh, you know, where the shrapnel went in and everything and it, where, it's, where it's scarred, it's all kind of scar tissue on there, he can see. And he said, you sure were lucky. He said, you know, a centimeter or so, one way or the other, just the slightest little bit, he said, You'd have lost that eye, mm -hmm. and he says he shows that picture to his colleagues, and they just can't believe it. So, have you been back to Vietnam, or hey, desire to go back? I would like to go back. Vietnam was a pretty country, and I know they do have tours. I don't know that I'll ever go back, but uh, I wouldn't mind going back because it was a pretty country with the mountains and the jungle and stuff. But uh, at this point in my life, I'm getting pretty old to travel too far. <laughs> uh, when you were over in Vietnam, uh, did were you visited at any of your base camps or major camps uh, by the, by the USO? Any, uh, any entertainment groups? We, we were out at one of our smaller base camps, and uh, we didn't have the ones like the Bob Hopes and stuff because uh, we were at a pretty small place. Uh, but we did have uh, Tippi Hedren. If you remember her, she was in that movie The Birds. Mm -hmm. She was there with Woody Hayes. Woody from Ohio coach. State, coach, and the coach at the time, I forget his name, he was a football coach at Ohio University. They came out and visited us, All right. which was very nice because I was a big Ohio State fan anyway, so seeing Woody Hayes was a big thrill for me. So, yeah. That, Did but, you get uh, a chance to meet him? Oh, yeah. Shook hands. He, he signed a little pad I had for me and stuff, uh -huh. and uh, yeah, sure right. did. He was really nice, yeah. They spent all the time they wanted. We wanted them there. They'd go around and meet everybody, talk to everybody. So that's the only ones I've met the time I was there. I never got to see one of the big, you know, USO shows or anything. But uh, Was that kind of a morale booster for the guys? I, yeah, I think so. Unless you were a Michigan fan, you know, <laughs> then it probably wasn't so hot then. But <clears throat> All right. Tom, uh, can you think of anything you'd like to ask him? Yes, several questions. Actually. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how many days were you in country in Vietnam? Uh, I was there probably, I see. Probably between seven and eight months. Okay. And how many of those days were you under fire? Actual under fire, uh, counting the harassment and stuff. Uh, 
I don't know, not a, not a big majority, maybe 30%. Okay. Um, you carried an M79 grenade launcher. Yes. I'm surprised they didn't issue a 1911 45. I was too, and a lot of people were. I don't know if they were short, I, but they didn't. The only thing I had was a was the M79. That's surprising. Yeah, a lot of people tell me that. Now, Bob, it's been really great to hear your story, and I don't want to upset you, but you didn't name him. The young man <clears throat> who was a buddy who organized a squad to come to your aid, and he was killed. What was his name? Ronald Hacker. Have you been to the wall? Yes, I have. Is he there? Yes, he is. God bless you, sir. Thank you. He was another Ohio buddy. He was up around right the Cleveland area. Uh -huh. So, yep. Nice guy. Great. Thanks for your commentary. Thank you. I appreciate it. Does that uh, bring anything else to mind that you might want to talk about? How many times have you been to the wall? Uh, I've been to the actual wall one time. And then I've seen the traveling wall probably three or four times. You know, the one they bring around to different mm -hmm. cities and stuff. I've probably seen that three or four times. So it's really touching, yeah. really nice. Well, if you don't have anything further, uh, thank you for this interview. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you it. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you it. Thank you.